although I'm 29 plus tax and gratuity, <laughs> I happen to be a product of busing in the late 1970s. And I remember before getting on the school bus, I would say to my mom, you know, they're not going to like me or no one's going to want to sit by me. And then I'd also question, was I smart enough? Was I good enough? And I would always talk about the they. And like any great black mother, what she said, who is they? And I say, well, you know they. And she goes, what's they name? They, uh, where do they live? And she would say, you know, a lot of that is in your head. And she said, come here, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something right now. And she said, you know what? As long as you like you, that's all that matters. As long as you love you, that's all that matters. And you not being good enough can never come from you. So stop all that foolishness, get your butt on that bus and go to school. And I said, okay, okay, and I did that. And so I listened to my mother, but it took me a little while to learn the lesson. And now as I fast forward into adulthood and professionalism, remember that took 29 plus tax and gratuity, I want to share with you one of my favorite quotes. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate by Carl Jung. I've been really marinating on that quote a lot lately, particularly as I see the laser focus on unconscious bias being the panacea for discriminatory practices in the workplace. And I began to also think about how many deep-seated beliefs have been unconsciously controlling my decision-making. More importantly, I've sat with the fact, the disturbing fact that what happens and what do I believe about me when my unconscious beliefs actually intersect with conscious constructs in the workplace and the they of my nightmares now greet me at the office door. So conscious bias, what actually is it? It's the overt behaviors, particularly those pieces of exclusion that exist in the workplace. And I know you've been buzzing around about unconscious bias, there's books and everyone's hosting training on that, but what they fail to actually address is the actual consciousness of the actions that are taking, where why can't we all not only get along, but feel like we belong? And so what does that actually sound like in the workplace? Well, it sounds like we love you and we welcome you here, but don't wear your natural hair. Oh, um, only speak English, and you darn sure better not put that compound chicken in the microwave. And you know what? Ooh, did you know that you were hired for that diversity and inclusion initiative? And my favorite of them all, I know there's a lot of unrest right now, but please know that we are committed to diversity and inclusion and belonging because all lives matter here. And so you think about this conversation about diversity. And diversity will ask who's in the room. And here I am wondering, do I belong in this room? Diversity will ask, how many more black, Latina, LGBTQ, queer, trans do we have this year than last year? And here I am sitting, am I the only one? And how long will it actually take for me to be like them? And inclusion will jump on board and say, have everyone's ideas been actually heard? While I sit at the table and wonder, do my ideas even have value and merit? And inclusion will ask, is this environment, is this environment safe for everyone to feel like they belong? And here I am sitting there still focused on how long do I have to fake it till I actually make it? Because where I come from, faking it till you make it is how we actually survive. And here we now have this term, this description, imposter syndrome. How many of you have heard of the term imposter syndrome? How many of you really know what it is? That's what I thought. And so my academic research is really around really reframing that imposter narrative, particularly as it pertains to black women and other minority ethnic groups. Because when the original study was done in 1978, they did not consider racial 
factors. They did not look at institutionalized racism and the fact that what I believe about me is often triggered by external factors. And that's part of being black in America. And so when you think about what does that look like in the workplace? What is triggering this imposter syndrome? Well, I had an opportunity to have what I thought was going to be one of my dream jobs last year. And for all my intelligence and all my brilliance and the fact that they valued me, so they say, my, after my very first meeting, and I kind of gave a little report, and then the very first thing at my very first follow-up meeting with my supervisor was, oh, you know, you talk too much. I said, I talk too much? I said, well, I just kind of gave you the report that you asked for. Yeah, but you should watch the faces of people. And I thought, what did I say? And I went through the list. However, she never told me what to report, so I gave a report on everything that I worked on. And then the next time I offered some advice, based on, again, I don't know, my 20 plus years of, you know, being a school principal, running schools, organizational development, and seeing some inefficiencies. So I added a couple of pieces that, hey, have you considered this? And I was told, that's not your lane. Oh, so what do I believe about me? And how is the environment in which I work impacting my mindset? Eight billion dollars is spent on average every year on diversity and inclusion initiatives. However, they're trying to change a behavior, check a box, avert costly legal action, but not actually trying to shift a mindset. It takes 21 days to break a behavior, I mean to break a habit, 20, 42 to break a behavior, and 63 to shift a mindset. So how is that one day of training going to change the dynamics and create a paradigm shift? How's that going to happen? And so when I'm looking in the mirror, feeling like an imposter, what I carry actually on my back is the conscious biases, the microaggressions, the trauma, the stereotypes, the bigotry that sits in the room with me. And when you think about the fact that we're often questioned, and I know I have, about whether or not what we say has merit, and then if we actually sound a little bit like me, then I am actually an anomaly, not the norm. You speak well. Oh, okay, I didn't know how I was supposed to speak. That's how everybody in my family speaks. And so it's things and behaviors like that that actually impact that. And when we think about how inequality is truly baked deep into our current capitalist society, how can I not feel like an imposter when all we really want to do is actually belong? And the research shows that it would take 95 years on this current trajectory to actually bring black people up to par in the workplace across all levels, 95 years. And there's this diversity paradox that actually exists. And this is the idea that everyone is different, but we all need to be the same. You see, we are hired for our diversity, but we are trained and programmed for assimilation. And so how can I actually belong? How can I actually be when the essence of me doesn't really fit the mold that you've already created. And so it does take a village. But here's the thing, my mentor John Maxwell says, great leaders ask great questions. And so it's going to take conscious, courageous leaders to shift the paradigm so that in the village that everyone actually belongs. And more importantly, I wanna leave you with a particular question leaders. What will you do when your unconscious bias becomes conscious? Thank you.